This program is made possible in part by the Moving Image Trust Fund. Hello again, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Born at Little Rock, Conaveri Valentius ventured west to Stanford for her undergraduate degree and then east to Harvard for a doctorate in the history of science. And today she professes at the University of Massachusetts at Boston. Her portfolio spans essentially the arts and sciences all, but in recent years her work has been figuratively, if not literally, seismic. She's researched and written extensively on an epic event that literally shook territorial Arkansas two centuries ago and rather more recently on the rather more recent tectonics of fracking. Back home in the spring of 2015, we lured her from a family reunion and we thank you very much for this time. What a pleasure. Thanks for having me. What in your background or what was it about the new, and of course we're talking about the new Madrid of 1811 and 1812. That's right. And it wasn't an earthquake, but as earthquakes happen, a series of That's problems. right. What piqued your interest? What, uh, what set the hook? You know, when I, if I were growing up, when I was growing up in Arkansas, if I had gone back in a time machine to my, you know, 10-year-old self and said, did you know that earthquakes in Arkansas would be a major focus of rethinking the earthquake history and of understanding how earthquakes work in the middle of tectonic plates? and that they would be central to debates about how we're gonna get our fossil fuels and what our energy future is, I would have said, that is as bananas as a time machine. Right? Past this prologue. But we, f but we found that out, yes. So I came across these earthquakes actually a long time ago when I was writing the first book about health and medicine in the early American frontier, and uh, came across Davy Crockett writing about jumping over earthquake cracks with his dogs chasing a bear in the East Tennessee woods. And I thought, huh, that's weird, because that doesn't make any sense to me. And I went back much later to say, well, what kind of sense does that make? And I realized how ignorant I was of the actual history of this environment that we're in now, and how little recognized that whole seismic history was. Stands between us, the product of your research, the lost history of the New Madrid earthquakes. That's right. A year old, but still quite valuable. <laughs> To put it at a, at a minimum, and I, I guess for those who may be not entirely familiar with it, the, the zone anyway is from basically southern Illinois. Yes. And reaches, sort of curves, and then reaches into northeast Arkansas. Yes, quite considerably. Yes, so if you go, actually if you go to the U.S. Geological Survey and look on the National Hazard Map, which is the just revised last summer, so, excuse me, summer of 14, um, and you look at the, what's called the seismic hazard map of the United States, which is where it's the USGS forecast to be regions where you should have heightened levels of earthquake preparation. There is a uh, large swath, as most Americans would suggest, of, you know, uh, would, would expect, uh, large parts of the West Coast are all in bright red, right? And there is a bright red oval sitting over the middle Mississippi Valley. Very bright red. Very bright red. One of those alarm bell right reds, and that's the New Madrid seismic zone. Let's go back two centuries. What, what, what do we know? And you unearthed uh, diaries, you unearthed letters, you, uh, not just Davy Crockett's, but others. Many and records, yeah. Just, what happened when it shifted, when those plates shifted 200 years ago? Oh, so what's exciting to seismologists today is it wasn't two seismic plates coming together, as most earthquakes were. It's in the middle of a tectonic plate. Nobody today, or very few people today, expect that sort of earthquake motion, and nobody at that time did. So what happened was, all of a sudden, dogs started to bark, and cattle started to howl, right? And birds flew up from the trees and from their roosts, and people heard huge rumbling noises, and the Mississippi became in tumult. So what was a large, broad-flowing river started to roil back and forth, 
um, water spouts came up, which is the r result of the bubbling up underneath the water surface of um, contained water that was underneath the, the, the water bubbling up from beneath it, and uh, water started to overspread the uh, land in some of these areas. The people talked about the land itself, this wonderful flat, fertile farm plain, right. rolling like the sea, whole big forests of very large trees snapped off mid-trunk. Um, in the series of earthquakes, a couple of small creeks got dammed up, so people looked out across what had been dry land to find new lakes formed. What had been seasonal waterways, right, became impassable swamp. So it was an enormous, engulfing, overwhelming experience involving bad smells and very alarming movements of the earth, but also movements in the water, right, and people at the time reported lightning flashing in the sky and, and lights in the sky. We wouldn't expect that today in an earthquake, but that's what people said at the time. And 200 years ago, there were there may have been a crossroads known as Jonesboro or a crossroads known as Memphis mm. or the other Not communities, yeah, yeah. but there weren't cities. It was sparsely populated, which that's right. counts for the comparative by yes. loss of life. And well, that's you know, right. Casualties. And one of the long-term stories we've had about the New Madrid earthquakes is, well, you know, a tree falls in a swamp and nobody hears it. What does it matter? Right? And part of what I was able to find, um, thanks to some really excellent record keeping up in local records, both in Northeast Arkansas and Southeast Missouri, is that in fact that region, right, you know, Northeast Arkansas, Southeast Missouri, which we think of as having, you know, a lot of fish and mosquitoes and not a lot else in that period of the late, late 1700s, early 1800s, in fact was a thriving zone of trade. Right? That was where people were importing all kinds of trade goods. A lot of native people. Yeah, from the Mississippi there is a yeah. Yeah. And that, commercial and that, freeway. It was. It was a commercial freeway for trade and for news and for goods and for diplomacy. And people were moving there from the, what's now the southeast right, to get away from Americans taking their land. And they were setting, settling there. And there were a number of settlements that were much larger than we've thought, running up and down what is now northeast Arkansas. And we've really not counted those as part of our history. And part of the argument in my book is, hey, when we look at the history of the earth, that can tell us a lot about human history that we haven't seen. And one of your themes is it is important, well, don't lose this history. Yes. We can't lose this yes. history because 200 years later, is it a question of if, how much of if and how much of when do we need to, to focus on in terms of the New Madrid today? Well, the scientists who I listen to about such things say we have to be prepared for large earthquakes in this region, right? So the USGS does a forecasting on a 50-year cycle, right. right? So they say, all right, the next 50 years, what's our chance of having an earthquake, this, or a set of earthquakes? Because one of the things that the scientists tell us is that there are series of very, very large earthquakes back in the distant past of this region, not just one, one set. But the 1811, 1812 events are only the most recent of these kinds of quakes to hit this area. So next 50 years, what can we expect? They say, well, we expect, based on what we know right now, seven to 10 percent odds of having something as large as we had in 1811-12. Not insignificant. But maybe much more important for our immediate planning is in that same 50-year period, the chances of having a moment magnitude six or larger, USGS estimates at 25 to 40 percent. And that's really significant because a magnitude 6 earthquake in some parts of the world might not do a lot of damage, but if it hits in an area that isn't prepared, that can be very serious indeed. So there is a really quite significant risk of a pretty large earthquake hitting, and that's maybe what you know, I think people need to pay attention to. An earthquake, say, in Big Sky, Montana is a lot different. A big earthquake in Big Sky, Montana is a lot different than a big earthquake near Memphis. Yes, what Coast we area. know is that earthquakes east of the Rockies, seismic waves travel much, much better in the eastern half of North America than they do in the western half. So, for instance, that earthquake a couple years back in Mineral, Virginia, that damaged the Washington Monument and got a nuclear reactor close to meltdown, that was, I think, a 5.8. Right. right. That's not really big on the scale of world earthquakes, but, you know, my husband felt it where he was sitting in Boston, right? And that was in Virginia. Right? Earthquake waves travel. So 
Um, but the, and the good news is that I learned working on this book is that some fairly commonsensical forms of earthquake preparation can help a lot, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be a choice between doing everything that's really expensive and doing nothing. Well, are we using, though, common sense? Well, do your listeners have a list of their medications and legal documents someplace, right? Do school kids know the phone number for an out-of-state relative that you call if the phone lines in your local region are down, right? Are um, generators in flood-prone regions up a couple feet so they don't go out? I mean, there are some small-scale things that, you know, you can go on disaster preparation websites and learn pretty easily that can make a big difference for coming back after something that's um, an alarming and damaging earthquake. On a larger scale, though, meaning the public policy scale, uh, did, you, did your research indicate that we are using common sense there? That gets expensive. It does get expensive, and I think there's also... Um, Which is to, yeah. not to say the step shouldn't be taken, but yeah. you're talking about building standards, uh, construction standards. Yeah. Retrofitting and that sort of thing. You know, Are we serious about it? Did you? Well, reach as a historian, what I kept seeing was again and again, people in Arkansas, in Tennessee, in Missouri, and other parts of these regions that make up the, what they call the New Madrid Seismic Zone, again and again, people listen to some usually outside expert come in and say, "You've got a high earthquake risk," and people will again and again say, "Well, I haven't felt anything, right? I, you know, my family's lived here for three generations. We haven't felt that." and people use their own experience. And I understand that, and that's how I think through a lot of things also. But I think what we have to understand is the Earth has a really long history, right? And we have to pay attention to that, right? That the records of this quake are before the family histories of almost anybody in this region, and that they tell us a different story. So unfortunately, what I see in the present day is a real, is still a lot of skepticism about people bringing in scientific evidence that doesn't match right what people's lived experience is just in their own lifetimes yeah all the more important one suspects because uh to state the obvious much of well we're talking about much of the path of the san andre or the of the new madrid i'm sorry uh fault runs through the it's jello I mean, it's just, it's beautiful, wonderful, dark, rich farmland, but it's yes. jello in terms of consistency. Exactly the reasons that make, you know, eastern Arkansas some of the richest farmland in the world <laughs> is what makes it an extremely good place um, to be a little seismic wave, <laughs> right? Yes, because it is what the geologists call unconsolidated sediment, right? It's really beautiful, rich soil, and that stuff shakes. So it does not take a very powerful earthquake to have quite powerful effects. Seismologists do believe that the New Madrid is, is, is that the plates involved there are moving at a far slower pace or, or rate than our other major faults in the U.S. and perhaps elsewhere in the world. It, it's a glacial, it's the term that pops to mind. Not that it should be discounted at all. Uh, tectonic plate movement does not play the role in mid-continent seismicity that it does at the edge of tectonic plates. Okay. So one of the, uh, you know, scientists would say one of the really interesting things, people in the region would say one of the very anxiety-producing things about the New Madrid fault zone is that we don't have a real good answer for what, at the very basic level, what causes these quakes. Why do they happen? There's a lot of debate about that and we don't know, which makes it harder to say are these, I mean, there are a couple of researchers who've put forward the idea that this was a hot spot that is cooling down. A much larger number of experts have also said, we don't see evidence of that. We see evidence of consistency that this is a region that has a series of very large quakes pretty consistently over geologic time. Let's come forward 214 years. Uh, <clears throat> 214 years now, we are 204, I, I guess, yeah, 204 years. Uh, and we're asking questions about earthquakes of what may be a different sort. And of course, this yes. is, comes with the rise of hydraulic fracking yes. for extraction of what, in Arkansas, mostly natural gas so far. Yes. Where are you in your research on that? You know, I am about where a lot of Arkansans are, which is, 
looking at a science that is emerging. As a historian of science, one of the things that is fascinating to me is that uh, I read the Arkansas papers about what people are saying, people in the local regions are saying about these earthquakes and saying, we think they're related to the, the injection wells associated with fracking. And then over the next couple of years, the scientific literature gives us very strong suggestion that that is indeed the case. People in Arkansas have said, we think they're related to wells that are longer ago in time and pretty far away. Once again, the scientific literature will, after a couple of years, begin to bear that out. So if you look at uh, publications in nature and in science and in the major journals, mm -hmm. just over the last five years, right, they have begun to put together a, uh, an increasingly persuasive set of models for how it is that small, si small earthquakes like the ones you know, a lot of your listeners have felt have been caused by the changing pressure caused by these injection wells. Now, the big question is, now. <laughs> what do we do about that? Right? right. So in fact, there was a, um, there's been an editorial exchange happening just in the spring of, of 15, actually, in a couple of the scientific journals about proposals by some seismologists for what do we then do, right? How do we want to implement systems of um, monitoring seismic activity near injection wells and near any kind of anything else that would inject a lot of fluid into the earth? and um, proposals for how we site those. Do we want to keep a perimeter of safe distance from hospitals, schools, nuclear facilities, and so on? Which is a main question in Arkansas. And are there, uh, do we want to then have what's, what some scientists are proposing as a kind of traffic light system, where when, if we see an increase in very, very small quakes, we decrease the volume of injection before they become large quakes. That sounds really good as an idea, right? Um, and it may well be where we decide to go as a set of communities. Um, that also depends upon having the seismic monitoring arrays, right? You have to have the seismic sensors in place. You have to have the staff who know what they're doing to check those. Right? And right now, um, there are some extraordinarily smart and hardworking people, um, especially here at Arkansas Geological Survey, but in other you know, federal and state agencies as well, right. who are working very, very hard to do this, but there are just not that many of them. Right? And much of the, not much, some degree of the uncertainty surrounding this question of causation, how much of these earthquakes are being caused by the injection wells, how much are not, some of this does have to do with the difficulties of even getting the exact data. And I think that, you know, if, if I were still an Arkansas citizen and voter, right, I think that's where I would feel like, okay, I can have something to say there, right? I'm not a seismologist, right? I can't make some of those determinations, but I could help be part of making sure that we know we have better data, right? And we have, we have our own experts able to uh, help interpret that data. Well, you, you're still part of the dialogue, part of the debate anyway, no matter where you live. You said you know, that the, the, the literature leans toward the persuasive anyway. I think that, yes. that was your term. Yes. Uh, but not, conclu not yet conclusive. As a lot of people around here... Science has never settled one, one say. Well, and, and there it are evolves. some of the small earthquakes that are happening around here are happening in the same place where we had what's known as the Enola Swarm in the 80s and then a couple of years, about 10 years ago. So it is the case that there are parts of Arkansas that have these, they call them swarms of earthquakes. It sounds kind of like a swarm of bees. It's this real interesting Well, thing. they were kind of swarming. Yeah, I that's mean, right. It, it yeah. kind of makes sense if for the people who yeah. felt them. And so it's, it's often very hard to say for sure what causes any particular earthquake. And in fact, some of the very recent scientific literature has been to try to um, develop a more articulated kind of set of parameters about how do we know, right? A couple of the things that are emerging more with, with greater and greater clarity, right, as we have more and more injection wells operating in many American states, right, Ohio, West Virginia, um, Pennsylvania, Texas, we've seen, in Oklahoma, certainly we've seen this. What we know now are that um, it, it looks very, very, very likely that earthquakes can be caused at some time, later, some distance in time from particular injections. And 
that they can be caused at much greater distances than we thought. And there have been some interesting scientific papers showing, m giving good models for how that is. Right. And I think that that is starting to change some of the thinking about these. Because if you're only looking at very, very small earthquakes in a very, very localized area at a very, very short time, you might have different mechanisms for controlling that than if you know that what you do now could cause a larger earthquake at some, some distance down the road. The preponderance of those reported in Arkansas have been, tra if you've had property damage, please don't call out, I recognize it, but, but uh, the preponderance of them have been basically just tremblers. Uh, there's yes. been, to my knowledge, very little substantial damage reported, substantive damage reported. Thank heavens. Yes, yes, that's right, that's right. So it is a question then, Doctor, just judging from the literature of not so much whether you frack or drill, but where? I would point out that there, there's still scientific debate about this, but there are many in the field in seismology right. who find the evidence for the 5.6 in 2011 in Oklahoma that was felt across six states. Mm -hmm. Many would say the evidence for that is looking very good. Right, that that was caused by injection wells. So the one story about injection well related earthquakes has been, well, they only would cause very small ones. I think it is uh, more of an open question right now about what level of earthquake they would cause. Right. So I guess as a historian, right, my job is to say, what can we learn from that history? Right. And part of what I would say is we look at much, much, much larger earthquakes of long ago, and they had convulsive effects on the society of the early Mississippi Valley, right, on the whole, on scientific ideas, on religious practices. I mean, a lot of people changed their, their faith life because of these earthquakes. Right? They had large effects on people coming into this, this part of the world, right, and what they did when they got here. These are non-trivial events. So, if we make our decisions going forward as a society, understanding that, that the stakes are large and that when the earth moves, it's not simply a question of, are my China dishes broken, right? right? But how does that, what does that do to my sense of confidence about, you know, um, where my children are in school or my larger sense that I understand that this is a place I can have my daily life? Right? That's, I think, what I as a historian can say is we have to understand that when the earth shakes, it's scary to people on a lot of different levels. Well, as an historian, well, we, we, we've got competing imperatives. Mm. Yeah, yeah, you've got, you know, safety on the one hand, way of life, a, a cultural norm, mm -hmm. uh, and also the campaign for energy sufficiency or, or sufficient energy to power you. Do those two, as an historian, do those two necessarily have to collide? Can they coexist? I wish I All had right, a, a fortune really, teller. I, mean, I was about to say, I wish I had a really short, positive answer to that. Um, I will say that I've never seen good decisions made when there's extreme disparity in resources, right? And if you look at um, the, the amount of staff time and that is allocated on the regulatory side to figuring these out, right, versus the kind of financial resources that can be brought in by very, very large companies that are, you know, helping us develop our energy resources, the regulatory agencies are really outgunned, right? And I think that's, that's something that is not okay and that, uh, that I think we can make better decisions if it's clear that the information that the public is basing decisions on is the best information out there. A few seconds remaining. Where, where are you going with this, this, this new budget? When do you, do you have a timeline? When are you going to publish? As soon as I can. <laughs> when you do, will you come back? Oh, what a pleasure. Always here to be it's with a, you. Okay, we'll consider that a promise. Thank Thanks you, sir. Thanks very much, Dr. Valencius. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.
This program is made possible in part by the Moving Image Trust Fund.